One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Beeson faculty, staff, students, alumni, guests, brothers and sisters, welcome to this chapel service, this time of worship, as we get to hear from our student preacher this semester. As a Beeson alum and local pastor, I am grateful for Beeson Divinity School in many ways. One of them is that they prepare pastors who can preach. Men and women who are great at caring for souls, walking with brothers and sisters through deep and dark valleys. Pastors who know the Lord intimately and invite others to follow them as they follow their good shepherd. But also pastors who can rightly divide the word of the Lord, who point the congregation, the the flock of God among them, day in and day out, weekly, to the word of the Lord. They point people to Jesus through the proclamation of the scriptures. That's what we need in the church is people, pastors who can rightly divide the scriptures and nourish the flock of God among them. And I see that embodied in Cole Griffith, our preacher today and the recipient of the James Earl Massey Preaching Award. Uh, It has been a privilege to walk alongside Cole in the past couple of years as one of his pastors at Iron City Church and his supervisor during the residency program, I've had the joy and pleasure of seeing Cole grow and mature. Uh, going from a recent college grad who had a calling on his life in the Lord and wasn't quite sure what that meant, uh, to a man who is full of the Word and Spirit, who loves Jesus deeply, who orients his life around him and invites others to join him in that. He's someone who seeks out the least of these. I've seen him shepherd college students over and over again at Iron City. But he is also a man who is a gifted preacher, who knows how to handle the word of the Lord, who has wrestled with it. I know he's wrestled with it today and is eager to bring that word to us. Cole hails from everywhere, he said, but most recently, Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And he has a uh, bachelor's degree in civil engineering from uh, the University of Alabama. So Cole, we hear you gladly today. If you will stand with me for the call to worship, we will hear the words of the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah 51, 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you are cut. And to the query from which you were drawn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man. And I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden and her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the singing and the sound of singing. Pray with me. Father, as we enter into this Advent season, we are even more thankful for this promise of hope that we hear in the words of Isaiah. Father, we still live in a dark world and the people who long for the fullness of your light. And we eagerly await for the return of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Help us to be faithful in preparing our hearts day in and day out for his return. We long for the coming of the garden again, more full and more true than ever. Father, we thank you for this time of worship, and we thank you for the faithfulness of your scriptures, and we thank you for your preacher, Cole Griffith, today. I pray that you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit, that you would carry him along, that you would bless the preparation that he has put into this time as he has wrestled with you with this text and proclaims the hope of your coming kingdom today. Father, we need ears to hear. Open our eyes, prepare our hearts, cut us, mold us, and shape us that we would leave this place more equipped to faithfully follow in the footsteps of our Lord, our Savior, and our brother, Jesus Christ. Bless this time. This is a sacred place where you are meeting with us. Help us not to miss that. 
Father, thank you for your loving kindness and your faithfulness that you have shown us through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. A reading from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God and having the glory of God, its radiance, like a more rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the 12 gates, at the gate, 12 angels, and on the gates, the name of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies foursquare, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its walls, 144 cubits, by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh, crystallite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysopras, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. 
but its light will be the nations excuse me but its light will be the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gate will never be shut by day and there will be no more night there that will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the lamb's book of life the word of the lord Well, good morning. Oh, I found my water bottle here. Um, man, I am just so honored and so excited to be with you all this morning. Um, I can't tell you how much of a privilege it is for me to be before you this morning. This is an honor I don't take lightly, and it's something that I cherish, and it is all the more special by everybody who is here with us this morning. And so before we begin, let me offer us up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good. And Lord, you are so good to us, and you have shown your goodness to us through the person of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray now that you would be in our midst, God, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, or that you would Meet us here even now in this moment. God, you would meet us here now, but you would take us up in a whirlwind of sorts to be with John as we see through Revelation 21. Lord, what is our future? What is our inheritance? And Father, I pray as we catch a glimpse, as we train our eyes to see for what to look for, I pray that we would be encouraged, but that we would leave this place humbled and ready to continue our worship of you and witness to your Son in this world. So, Father, I pray you be with us. I pray you speak through me. If there's any word that I utter out of my mouth that's not of you, I pray that it would fall on deaf ears, but only what you say remains. So, Lord, I pray that you be here with us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you be here with us even now. And it's your powerful and strong name. I pray these things. Amen. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't spend the first little bit of time here uh, offering up some thanks, some thanksgiving for the people who have been so influential to me over my time here at Beeson Divinity School. First, I want to thank my wife, Jada, for constantly being, <laughs> constantly being a uh, word of encouragement and challenge to me. She has been such a gift to me um, and to so many other people that we know. And so thank you to my family also for being here, traveling from far and near, and without you seriously and truly, I would not even be at Beeson Divinity School. So I'm grateful for your support. To my professors who have challenged me to reckon with God's word seriously, to treat it with the utmost importance, and who have given me the tools to parse through it by studying Greek and Hebrew and demanding excellence, I'm eternally grateful for your investment into me and to all of us. To Dr. Smith, who we continue to keep in our prayers for recovery, I thank him for being a person to point me to the great shepherd when I was in need of him. And to Dr. Webster for helping me to understand and put together the pieces of our text this morning in Revelation and for leading our mentor group and for being um, a constant voice of encouragement and um, for showing us the beauty of pastoral life. Thank you. And finally, for you all, for my classmates, for family, for friends, for you all being here for some reason to hear me, but more so for your friendship over the years and for your investment into me. You guys are why I'm doing this. I love each and every one of you, and I'm so grateful that you would be here. So enough of this happy stuff. We can get down to business. And as Dr. Smith often says, we have a long way to go in a short time. To get there. I don't think he came up with that phrase, but we continue nonetheless. So before we begin, though, I must make a confession before you all, and please don't hold this against me. My confession is that the book of Revelation, John's Revelation, the text that we are in today, scares the daylights out of me. I Honestly, don't know what I'm reading half the time. It's a picture that is intense. The scenes and the imagery are complex, and it takes 
a lot of foreknowledge beforehand to really understand what he's even trying to say. I remember when I was a kid, and there was some movie about with a guy like Captain Kirk or Cameron something, I don't remember his name exactly, but there was a movie that came out that was based off of a book or a comic book or something, and it captured the attention of the world. And I remember seeing this movie in bits and pieces, and I thought, I need to get down to the bottom of this because this seems pretty important. This seems like something I need to know because I don't want to get left behind. So I decided I would go to the source material. I'd get down to the text, the nitty-gritty. But I figured, you know, why bother with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Why not just skip over to the end, right? I mean, who needs all that stuff? I pretty much got the gist of the story. I grew up in church, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know. I know what happens pretty much up to Revelation, but Revelation, that's the stuff that you really want to get to. That's the stuff that is interesting, right? It's the story that hasn't happened yet. We like to live there. And so I, my, I don't know, maybe 10, 12-year-old self, decided I'm going to journey through Revelation, and I'm going to understand everything about it. And when I tell you that I made it about halfway through before I ran to my mom, inconsolable, weeping and terrified. I'm not exaggerating. I was terrified. I didn't sleep for weeks because I was afraid that someone might sneak a Sharpie, write 666 on my forehead or my hand, and that would be it for me. So if you're anything like me, you like to skip over Revelation. I mean, how much does it really contribute to our theology, right? If you're anything like me, you like to you think that you know the gist of the story and that we can just leave that on the shelf. We're good with just 65 books. But again, if you're anything like me, maybe these last couple years have been pretty tough. A lot of us have faced loss on a scale that we've never conceived before. A lot of us have buried loved ones too early. A lot of us have dealt with real losses. Some of us have dealt with ambiguous losses. We don't know how to put the pieces together when we're having to live life through a screen, or we've missed graduation, or we've missed weddings. We have gone through a lot. So if you're anything like me, maybe it's only been in the last couple years you've really understood and felt the phrase in your bones cry of the saints who say, come, Lord Jesus. Maybe it's the first time you've had to deal with tragedy that you can't control. Maybe it's the first time you've had to deal with the cost of following Christ in the world. And the first time you hear your voice say, how long, O Lord? See, it's easy to talk about Revelation in a seminary, in New Testament class. It's easy to talk about it from a matter, a point of view of speculation. It's easy to pontificate as to the intricacies of the end times as if it were a game or a puzzle that we put together on Thanksgiving Day. But for the Christians of John's audience and for the Christians of today in the majority world, This book is not a game. The promises of this book are imminent because death is constantly set before them. And so John beckons us to ask the question, how do we live in the delay of Christ's return? What are we to do in the meanwhile? How do we worship in the midst of persecution, how do we witness to Christ in the waiting? And so, John's revelation is an apocalyptic epic. It is a prophetic parable. It's a story that places us in the midst of the tension between the caught up and the caught between. And it begs us to ask the questions of how do we face suffering? What do you do when things get hard? What do you do in 
the meantime, how do you reckon with death? And so we've walked through a lot. And if you've been a part of or around the Beeson community in the last semester, you know that in the month of October, we participated in a little friendly competition. It will be forever enshrined and known as Laptober. It's pretty simple if you think about it. And I'm not bitter about my team not winning. <laughs> though I do think we got skimmed a few laps here and there. But the whole idea of the competition was to encourage us students to suspend the immediacy of the tasks that we have before us, to take a break, to get our nose out of the book and to get into the real world, to take a lap or two around Sanford's pristine and beautiful campus, to maybe get to know somebody new, but really just to be refreshed in the beauty and splendor of God's good world. And so this is the trajectory for our time together this morning. I thought that it would be fitting and right that John might serve us as a Virgil of sorts and that we together with him might take a lap or two around the New Jerusalem, the fruition of our hopes. And we might see it as a place that we are destined to. For. We might see it and uncover it as a people that we are becoming and one day fully will be, and we hold fast to it as our future. And so, we can witness and worship the Lord together as we walk and we confess before we enter that the Lamb has conquered death. And so, let's get on our way. Let's go and take a little walk. So we enter into Revelation 21. And immediately, all of our senses are engaged. I mean, we walk in, and the scene is bright, uncomparably to anything we've ever seen before. And look, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And what is that? Is the holy city coming down out of heaven from God? And a voice is overwhelming the whole scene. He's saying, the dwelling place, the tabernacle of God is with man. He is our God, and we are his people. He himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The tears of our tragedies, the tears of our mourning are gone forever. And what's more, my back doesn't hurt anymore. The pain of grief and old age and mourning are gone, never to be seen again. Our enemy has been defeated. Death, that which stood against us fully and finally, is nowhere to be found. The curse of the ground is being, is done away with. See, the New Jerusalem is the place where everything works out. It's the place where everything goes the way that you hoped it would. It is the land that produces 100% yield. Or the driveway that you catch every green light on. It is the, gra- the place where the grass is truly greener. And we feel the pull of New Jerusalem. We feel the pull of this place in our bones even today. And we feel it by way of negations. We feel it by way of what is not in this world. And so C.S. Lewis, he talks famously on desire. And he says a quote that pretty much you know everybody knows. He says, if I find in myself desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, well then, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. See, sisters and brothers, we know our curse well. We're well acquainted with it. I know it well, and nothing, I mean nothing, makes me more frustrated than when I can't find what I need. My wife can attest to this fact. Because sometimes I need the TV remote. Sometimes I need that one pair of gym shorts I was looking for. Sometimes I need that one special coffee mug I planned on taking to class. But if we're honest, 
And if we ask ourselves truly, the reason that we, that we get frustrated when these plans don't come together is because they are bitter reminders of the world that we currently inhabit. See, we know by way of negation, we know by what is not what we're destined for. And that's why we love it when a plan does come together. And so hopefully in the New Jerusalem, one, I will be a bit more patient. By God's grace, I think I'm growing in that. And two, it is the place of God's order. It is the place where everything has a place. Nothing is out of place. Nothing no longer is uh, outside of God's purview and his ordering. See, there we will no longer have to earn our place before one another. We'll no longer have to compete to prove ourselves. We'll no longer have to try to show others that we're strong enough or smart enough or rich enough. Not too blind. There no ill will ever befall us. The ground is redeemed, and there we'll long enjoy the work of our hands, according to Isaiah 65. See, the New Jerusalem is the garden, all grown up. It's grown up into a city. It's expanded and restored, and it is permanent place for you and I forever. And if we keep moving through our walk with John, we see in more vivid detail the city that's coming down. And look, it's adorned and dressed like the bride. It has many jewels that Jason so wonderfully pronounced correctly. It is adorned with every jewel in the breastplate of Aaron, the high priest. God shares with her his glory. She is beautiful. She is radiant, and she is coming down from heaven. But if we look closer, we see that she's actually a city. We see that she is that city. She is the city whose maker and builder is God, who has foundations. She is the collective of God's society. Her dimensions are a perfect cube. After the Holy of Holies, the two cubes of Scripture, she is the immediate presence. She is dwelling and combined and married to the presence of God forever. This is the marriage supper of Lamb. The New Jerusalem and the bride of the Lamb are figural representations. They are the collective whole people of God. They are taken from every tongue, tribe, and nation. They are collected from space, time, and history, and they are gathered together to be joined to God forever. And they are the light of the world. They are the city that's on the hill. And they serve in the same way as the uh, temple did in the Old Testament. See, we see in Revelation 21 26, it says, The nations bring their glory to the city. Now, I don't really know that y'all know how good a news this is. If the nations bring their glory to the city, well, then that means in the New Jerusalem we'll be enjoying the glories of Pad Thai and sushi rolls. And chorizo queso dip. Y'all have that? And even Eugene's hot chicken, if you know. Our ears will be touched by the familiar sounds of Bruce Springsteen and uh, K-pop even, maybe, and soul music and disco and all these things that we love and glory in today. These are contributions that we bring to the city and every culture, tribe, and tongue will bring theirs. See, In the New Jerusalem, we'll have no lack. We'll have no wants, and therefore there will be no need for envy or covetousness. The wolf and the lamb will dwell and graze. Together the lion will eat straw like an ox. In other words, the law of the jungle is rendered obsolete and useless. Love alone remains, and now we are able to give ourselves freely to our neighbor. Richard Bauckham, he is a theologian who has a commentary on Revelation. He says in one of his commentaries that in the New Jerusalem, we, his people, will serve in God's immediate presence as priests. We will reign with him as kings. And if we look further, the second curse that we see found in the Garden of Genesis 3, the curse of relating, that is cured as well. See, there in that place, death no longer surprises us. 
Death no longer confronts us in the midst of life. See, in our lives here and now today, we are constantly assailed. We are overshadowed by the threat of death. It's before us. It's behind us. It's ahead of us. It's always on our mind, threatening to ruin our plans, threatening to interrupt. But there, sisters and brothers, death will pose no threat to intimacy. Death will not get in the way of a happy family. Death will not leave children without fathers and babies without mothers or spouses without each other. It will pose no threat to our intimacy. Neither will arguments or resentments or bitterness or drama or anything that we let stand in between us. No. Love alone remains. We are collected together as one people. And so a lot of people think that the new Jerusalem will just be Jesus and me up in the big marble cube in the sky. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the New Jerusalem is the triune God in us. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and the whole people of God collected together to serve and worship Him forever. If we move a bit further into our walk with John, we see the, <clears throat> we see the surety of our hope. We see it's like an anchor pulling us forward through this life. And we hear a voice crying out loud saying, Behold, I'm making all things new. Write this down, for these are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And nothing unclean will ever enter it, that is, the city, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, God is all in all. He is our future. He is our past. And there he will do away with the former things. So we have to make sense of what to make of these. What is John talking about when the former things have passed away? What do we make of the absence of the sea? And what I would, suppo- what I would propose for us to consider this morning is that the, sea is the, pro- the absence of the sea is the promise of security. See, in the absence of the sea, it's God's pledge that things in the new creation will be good for good. Now, is John saying that the sea itself, there will be no bodies of water present there? I, I mean, I wasn't there. I couldn't tell you. But I don't necessarily think that's what he's getting at. See, John has used uh, the sea to describe a number of thematic things throughout the book. As recently as Revelation 20, he's described it as the holding cell of the dead. We've also seen him characterize it as the strength of the idolatrous and unbelieving nations. And he's also identified it with the location of the world's conniving dog-eat-dog economic activity. But I think the largest illusion of reference we have to take is to Genesis 1, and that is the primordial chaos, the waters that the Spirit of God hovered over at the beginning of creation. See, at the beginning, all was welter and waste. It was chaos. Peter talks about this in 2 Peter 3, uh, verses 5 through 7. There he says, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Now, by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction the ungodly. So we see that God created the world. He ordered chaos into something beautiful, livable, and inhabitable by his word and through water. And by the same rate, he purified it through the waters of the flood in Genesis 6. And so as it stands today, creation is waiting for the purification and judgment by fire. And Revelation is the prophetic illustration of these Happenings. It tells the story of God's all-consuming fire. But now, at our point in Revelation 21, all has been told. See, all the pure impurities have been burned out. All the wickedness and vileness has been melted away. And all that remains in creation is pure gold. 
Everything remains is good. In the absence of the sea, John is saying that the work is finished. There's nothing left to add or take away. The earth and the heavens are full and final. He's saying that evil has had its day. That it's over. The game is won. It's as the psalmist says, you discard the wicked of the earth like dross. And the prophet Malachi says, who can stand before him? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's so, but he will purify them and they will bring gifts of offerings of righteousness to the Lord. All evil, everything that we read and listed here in Revelation 21, all evil and its effects and those who do it are gone forever, never to impinge upon God's good world ever again. All the impurities are melted out. Dr. Webster and his Commentary on Revelation puts it this way, the symbolic absence of the sea in Revelation 21 is not necessarily no ocean in the new creation, but it is an ocean where there are no drownings. It is an ocean, a beach trip where there's no shark attacks. All that remains are beautiful ocean vistas, great swells that declare the might and power of God and a sea teeming with his creation. The last thing that we see in our text is simply our future. John unveils the end. He tells us the end of the story. He is the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the telos. He's the purpose of all history. Brothers and sisters, he is our future. He is the truth of our being. And I have news for us this morning. And that is, the end has shown up today. The end has shown up in the Lamb that was slain. Jesus Christ, in his birth, death, and resurrection, is the full appearance of the future reign of God. And now he reigns in our hearts by his Spirit, and he lives enthroned with God today. Revelation 1 gives us the vision, the image of who Jesus is today. He is the one who wears the white robe, whose train fills the temple of our hearts. He's the one who wears the golden sash, the high priest's garb, the one who has won the victory, who has made mediation for us in God by his blood. He's the one who has eyes like flames of fire, who sits in the seat of judgment, whose roar is like mighty waters, but who also speaks gently to us in a whisper. He is the one who is gentle and lowly, but he is also high and mighty, lifted up. The sword of his mouth comes and strikes the nations. It's the word of God. Sisters and brothers, the lamb who was slain is the king who reigns. He is before us today. The Son of Man is before us today. And so, if we miss out on Revelation, we miss out on the pulse, the litmus test, the picture of our present. See, we live in detention of the already and the not yet. We live in the tension of God's triumphal return, that he is coming back to make the world right and new, but it hasn't happened yet. On the one hand, God is all-powerful and just and righteous, and he will come and hold evil to all account. But on the other hand, he is patient, desires that none should perish, but that all should repent. He gives people time. And so what we find in the book of Revelation is a theology of faithfulness. It is a theology of abiding to the end. It is an encouragement to continue in the midst of suffering and uncertainty when the world seems to be against us to trust that God is at work in our waiting, that God is doing more with us than we could ever do with ourselves. And that though we may succumb to suffering and trials, God is not surprised by any of this. God is at work, and we don't see it. And so, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when trials and sufferings of many kinds come. Because the great mystery of Revelation, 
the great gotcha moment, the unveiling, the flip, is that somehow, some way, suffering is often the strategy. Somehow, some way, the suffering of the righteous, that very thing that God pledges his imminent action to resolve in the coming of his kingdom, is actually a strategy for how he plants seed of his word in people's hearts. I'll say that again. The suffering of the righteous, this very thing that God has imminently promised and pledged himself to re- resolve, somehow, some way, is used to turn the hearts of our enemies and oppressors back to God. It's a divine mystery. Or are you unaware that when you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death? Or Are you not aware that you should arm yourself with the same way of thinking? We love our enemies. When we pray for those who persecute us, what we are doing is heaping hot coals on their head. And these coals serve the same purification function as we see in Isaiah. They are cleansing those. They are revealing their wrongs. It is this redemptive suffering. The world cannot stop. The world can kill us and strike us and make us poor, but it will never stop the Word of God. Maybe I can put it in a more traditional way. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so, our hearts and our bodies belong to God. And so, as I come to the conclusion, as we walk toward the end here, uh, some of us might have some questions. I have a lot of questions myself, and not all of them get answered. But some of the things that I think we might think to ourselves is, so, so what is this message? What is Revelation actually encouraging us to do? I mean, should we just let people walk all over us? Or should we let, seek out suffering, even? I think what we have to remember is that life is a pilgrimage. Life is a journey to a city that is our true home. It is a venturing through land that is not ours. And we, through this life and through this pilgrimage, walk through many cities and temptations. We often walk through Rome and think that we have to earn and defeat our enemies by might. We often walk through Babylon and think that the answer lies in seduction and playing the long game and trying to connive and cheat our enemies so that we can win. And our temptation is always toward Self-justification. Our temptation is always to try to prolong our lives as if it were up to us in the first place. Our temptation is to defend the faith as if it would disappear without us. But sisters and brothers, this is the good news that John has for us this morning. Is that the new Jerusalem is not a city that we build up to try to touch the heavens. No, it's a city that comes down to us. It's a city that God establishes us in. It's not that anything that we do by our own might or power, but it is what God does in us. And so as John continues to unveil this illustration of abiding in times of trouble, the answer that nobody wants to hear, the answer that nobody wants to hear, what do I do in times of trouble, what do I do in the midst of suffering, is simply wait. It's the question of the saints in Revelation 11. They say, how long, O Lord? And he says, wait a little longer. Now this might not sound like good news for us, but I promise you it is. I promise you to wait means that I don't have to worry about making it. To wait means that I let God do for me what I could never even do for myself in the first place. To wait means I don't have to fear being left behind. To wait is to conquer. It's to remain. It's to abide. It's to take God at his word. In other words, this is what it means to believe. To hold fast to God's promises when everything seems counter to what we hold them as. This is the meaning of the scroll in Revelation 11. There, John is told by the angel to take the scroll. It's the scroll that has the seven seals that pop off and horrible things happen. Uh, It's the scroll that he's told to eat. 
It's sweet to the taste, but it's bitter as it goes down. Brothers and sisters, how sweet it is to trust in Jesus, but the bitterness of death is always before us. How sweet it is to take him at his word, but that doesn't mitigate the hardship and the challenges of this life. And all we can do is hold it together. It takes faith to take these two things in stride. And so the good news for us this morning is that Jesus is Lord today, as he is today. The image we see of him in Revelation one. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end, and he is the end of our story. The Lamb has conquered death. And so if you're weak this morning, if you're weary, if you're heavy laden and tired of trying to uphold an image for yourself that you constantly have to curtail, you constantly have to curate, you constantly have to maintain, then come and drink from the water of life without price. If you are tired, if you are longing to see loved ones again, be it your parents or your spouse, your children, whatever it may be, if you're dying for a new day, if you're waiting for a new life, a new heaven and a new earth, a new world, come and drink. It's free. He gives it freely. Sisters and brothers, this is our confession. We say it together. The Lamb has conquered death and we cry with all the saints. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. The James Earl Massey Student Preaching Award is given every semester to a graduating senior who demonstrates exceptional promise and proficiency and fruitfulness as a preacher of the Word of God. Dr. James Earl Massey was a mentor and friend to many people at Beeson before I arrived, but there are a lot of people in this room who can testify to his faithfulness as a preacher and to his helpfulness as a brother in the Lord. He was known as a prince of preachers himself. He went to be with the Lord in June of 2018, but I'm proud to say that his legacy as a preacher and as a man of God continues to live on here at Beeson, partly in and through this preaching award. The winner, of course, of this year's Massey Prize is our brother, Cole Griffith. Cole's just preached a wonderful, beautiful sermon on the glory, the, the beauty, the faithfulness of God demonstrated in the New Jerusalem. Uh, thank you, Cole, for taking us on a few laps around Revelation 21. I don't know about you. I, I've been here and, and presented these Massey Prizes several semesters in a row now, and pretty much every time uh, I sit and listen and learn uh, about the text that's being expounded. But I also think about the faithfulness of God to his people, to his church. I think about the, the promise that Jesus made that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, against his people. Lots of pastors have been going through very difficult times, last couple of years especially. A lot of them are burning out. Some of them are retiring early. Some are thinking about quitting. But I was reminded this morning uh, that God continues to raise up faithful ministers of his word, faithful ministers to his people. And I'm grateful to you, Brother Cole, for, for further evidence of that this morning. Let me do what I usually do and tell you a little bit about what Cole's favorite professors say about him. One of his teachers testifies that, quote, from my initial meeting of Cole to this very moment, he has demonstrated a spirit of humility along with a warm smile and a kind heart. Cole's love for the Lord shows in his interaction with his classmates, faculty, and staff. Another prof shared with me a comment from a fellow student. I don't know who it is. Maybe it's somebody sitting here right now. Cole is a lot more than a preacher, this student says. He actually has a preacher's heart. And Cole's primary preaching prof says... Cole was born to preach, and in the email I got that had an exclamation point after it. 
He requested appointments to review his preaching and fervently search for his preaching voice long before he took my preaching class. In the preaching class, he emerged from this desired journey of the preacher, having evenly married biblical content and an attractive delivery style. His great desire is to be a full-time pastor so he can regularly feed and disciple his flock. So what a marvelous desire. What a marvelous set of gifts and skills the Lord has given and enabled in the life of our brother Cole. It's with great joy that I invite Cole to join me here at the lectern and present him with this prize. Cole, I've given Jada some some extra gifts for you, uh, and there's a cash prize coming your way too. But what I want to do is uh, let everybody hear about what's on this certificate. This is the James Earl Massey Preaching Award for Excellence in Faithful Proclamation of Holy Scripture. The faculty of Beeson Divinity School recognizes and commends William Cole Griffith. Would you join me in congratulating Cole? Thank you, brother.